Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, it's, it's my honor to be recognized to address you here on the floor uh, on the, the United States House of Representatives. And um, I intend to take up the topic of uh, the commemoration of the life of Phyllis Schlafly. And uh, Madam Speaker, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous materials on the topic of this special order here this evening. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this, um, this sad news uh, came to me this past weekend uh, that the relatively long and extraordinarily productive and impactful life of Phyllis Schlafly had come to an end at the age of 92. And I got to know Phyllis uh, throughout the political activism of the, of the country among conservative politics. That goes back for me uh, quite a ways now, too, I might add. But I didn't pay a lot of attention to what was going on in the early 70s when Phyllis Schlafly's eyes went on uh, some of the transformative shifts that were taking place in America. And she was a pro-life activist before Roe versus Wade. Uh, she saw it coming. She knew what it meant. And she became one of the strongest pro-life in all of America, and I would say the most persistent, the most consistent, and the most relentless voice for the longest period of time. Uh, Phyllis was active on the public scene from at least as far back as 1952 all the way up until the last days of her life, which ended this past weekend. And I'd like to go through some of those milestones of Phyllis Schlafly's life and then uh, perhaps have some comments about about those milestones along her life. As, uh, as I review some of that material, Madam Speaker, uh, I look back on her impact, in, particularly in Republican politics. But um, she was a campaign manager for a, uh, for a successful Republican candidate for Congress in St. Louis in 1946. It was for Claude Bakewell. She served as an elected delegate to eight Republican national conventions. I don't know that there's been a more consistent or persistent voice at our Republican National Conventions over more than a half a century uh, than we've heard from Phyllis Schlafly. But she was an elected delegate to the conventions, Republican conventions in 1956, 1964, 1968, 1984, 1992, 1996, 2004, and 2012. And you might wonder, what was she doing in those missing convention years of 1960, 1980, 2000, and 2008? Well, she was an elected alternate in those conventions, and I would suspect that uh, her choice was similar to that that I had made a time or two in the past as well, that I wanted to make sure that there were young people that had an opportunity to be a delegate and young people that had an opportunity to come up and be active in politics. And, and there's uh, Phyllis Schlafly had, had facilitated thousands of young people to come into active politics. And um, then, then also she attended the Republican National Convention in Cleveland this last July, where it was the last time that I saw her as she came into the Republican reception, the members' reception upstairs. And I had an opportunity to, uh, to speak a few words with her and, and see that radiant smile on her face. And she was dressed in a, in just a very, very, I'll call it a, a colorful and a gracious um, um, dress, and seated in a wheelchair and. I, the brightness in her eyes told me there was a lot of spirit left in Phyllis Schlafly. Um, but she is a, she's played an active role in every Republican National Convention since 1952. And the, the earliest real impact when people began to notice who Phyllis Schlafly was, was when she published the book on May 1st, 1964, A Choice, Not an Echo. Um, a small little book. Uh, that gave us, uh, gave us an understanding about how presidential candidates are selected. This was a little bit, uh, it was a description of some of the backroom deals that were made about the dynamics of the presidential nomination process. Uh, she called it for 1964. She identified who the backroom supporters would be, how they would try to stop Barry Goldwater from being nominated. And the, the, the book, A Choice Not an Echo, holds up to this day. And uh, she wrote a supplement to it as well to bring it up to speed and published that book sometime in the last year or two. But A Choice Not an Echo was an impact. 
It was an impactful book, and it was one that is one of the foundational documents that identifies uh, the basis of modern-day conservatism. And Phyllis Schlafly was one of um, a very few uh, original conservatives here in America, and she has been one of about three voices that uh, were still active in the public scene that go back to that era in the early 60s. And for Phyllis, clear back as far back as 1946, and it was she managed a congressional campaign. But uh, and Phyllis's life has been deeply engaged in this kind of activity. Uh, she was the elected first vice president for the National Federation of Republican Women, uh, 1960 to 64. From 64 to 67, she was a candidate for Congress from Illinois in, in 52 and 1970 in two different districts. She received numerous awards. And um, then she founded the Republican National Coalition for Life in 1990 with a specific mission of protecting the pro-life plank and the Republican platform. And no one, no one has been more active uh, and had more voice on the pro-life movement and more effective than Phyllis Schlafly uh, throughout these years. And her voice on this public scene will sorely, sorely be missed. The, um, she was a volunteer for the, and a founder of Eagle Forum. And all of the people that worked with and for Eagle Forum uh, out across through the states came as volunteers. But she also established offices in Alton, Illinois, and here in Washington, D.C., and kept a voice and a presence here. And Phyllis Schlafly became a conscience for conservatives. This conscience for conservatives that, um, as is, we're trying to... Um, clarify the meaning of the Constitution, understand our place in history, and stand up for those principles that matter. Often the voice of Phyllis Schlafly was echoing in our ears here on the floor of the House of Representatives. And she would gather the young eagles to come here at least once a year, usually twice a year, to hear from them and give a number of us an opportunity to speak to the young people and take questions. But the bright lights that she identified that she brought into activism have made, I think, a dramatic difference across America as that conscience of conservatives was multiplied across hundreds and then thousands of young eagles that I had an opportunity to meet with and exchange ideas with and listen to. One of my, um, one of my stories about Phyllis Schlafly, um, I'll start at first this, that when I arrived here in this Congress 14 years ago, one of the first days that I was here to walk out on this floor to vote, I walked back through the back of these chambers and one of the members from Missouri, Todd Aiken, uh, came over to me and introduced himself. And uh, he said, I want to talk to you about court stripping. And I said to him, you mean Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution? Uh, and he said, yes. How do you know that? Well, the reason I'd paid attention to that was because it was Phyllis Schlafly that had written about it. And in my years that I'd been working in my construction office, and all I ever really wanted to do was raise my family, run my construction business, I didn't really think about being involved in trying to be in the middle of public policy. I thought there were good, reliable people that would be here making those decisions. But I would send off for what at that time were little articles that I would call, uh, little, you, had to, you had to sign up for them, you had to send off a check, and they'd send you the mailing of the, her forum document. Uh, Phyllis was all over the newspapers. Some, uh, oh, I can't count all the publications, but I know she's published at least 27 books. But I would read these articles that would show up in these publications. Maybe the headline caught me, but I'd skip the author. And then I'd read the story. I'd read the, read the article. And, I'd, boy, that is, a, that is clarity of thought, utter clarity of thought. And then I'd look up and say, who wrote that? Phyllis Schlafly. Time after time after time, before I really knew who Phyllis was, I was reading her material. She was impacting my thinking. And I'm wondering, who wrote this document? Phyllis Schlafly. Hundreds and thousands of documents, hundreds of, and, and thousands of analysis that she had done, and and not only that, not disciplined to stick to a particular topic. I was looking through some of these topics that Phyllis had written books on. Of the 27 books, she picked a few topics: family and feminism. Her book on family and feminism, the power of the positive woman, and feminist fantasies. Thanks those things that won't come true. Phyllis Schlafly. Her comment on the judiciary, that's called the book called The Supremacists. I have it here. It's the tyranny of judges and how to stop it. 
I have a story about that I might tell. Power, Obama's War on Religious Freedom. Her book on nuclear strategy, the strike from space and Kissinger on the couch. Uh, then her book on education, child abuse in the classroom. Her book on child care, who will rock the cradle. And on phonics, first reader and turbo reader. That is an example of the kind of work that Phyllis did. She wasn't narrow at all in her scope. Um, she understood she understood her faith, her Christianity, her religion, her role as a mother of six, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. She understood her role as a wife. She understood her role as a student, as a, as a law student with a law degree. And she understood her role here in America. And when the ERA came forward, and it was a mistake then, it would be a mistake now. Phyllis Schlafly, when they thought it was all done and that Equal Rights Amendment was going to be ratified, there were a few states left, Phyllis Schlafly started the battle to shut down the ERA. And it was almost single-handed for a long time as she mobilized a nation and put an end to the Equal Rights Amendment, which would have ended up with drafting women into the military. And there's much going on today that she didn't agree with, but we have slowed down this train of liberalism. She has been a significant player in it. And I see that we have some members that arrived at the floor uh, that I believe would like to add some words to this. And I'd like to there's a gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, if he's prepared uh, to uh, offer his words and I deal to the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, it's an honor to be able to talk about Phyllis Schlafly, and though I never personally met her, like many of the heroes of our country, uh, all Americans benefit from the service uh, that she rendered to our country, and in particular to the Republican Party. She's the person, uh, perhaps more than anyone, who made sure that the Republican Party is the party of life that really is out there to this day on the side of science, showing when life begins and showing what's happening. Uh, at, at every stage of life. And uh, I'm more optimistic than ever about what's, what's happening to show this fact. But a voice there that just knew the truth and was uh, unashamed in speaking for it, unashamed in helping our party uh, coalesce around a, a core set of beliefs. And those core beliefs are the same ones our founders had. So when people look back and think that, you know, hey, the founders were this uh, era of giants, uh, it's neat to have lived in an era when we have some of our own. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly, one of them, but certainly set the stage for Ronald Reagan's speech, A Time for Choosing, because of her activities in the 1964 campaign. And because of A Time for Choosing and Reagan's uh, success in that, success as governor, and uh, really shaping our modern party for, for the era that's been a uh, conservative movement for a long time. And that set the stage for Justice Scalia. So an eventful year, a sad year to see her pass and Justice Scalia pass in the same year. But also, uh, you know, an era when we can look forward to future success and an era when we can see what the true meaning of uh, womanhood is all about. She was a champion for women in a way she may never get credit for. So I'm honored for, for her service to our country, for her defense of her faith and my faith and for her contributions to make this the kind of country that uh, really inspires so many around the world to see it as the land of opportunity. So thank you. I yield back the time. And reclaiming my time and thanking the gentleman from Ohio for his presentation here. Um, that uh, not only uh, appreciate the kind words about the life of Phyllis Schlafly, but uh, the the voice of commitment to the conservative cause that emerges as we listen to the gentleman's words from Ohio. And um, I would... Uh, I would like to now, if I could, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber, who's arrived. And I would note also that our great friend, Michelle Bachman from Minnesota, is here on the floor of the House of Representatives tonight. And um, that adds a tremendous amount of joy to me to uh, what otherwise is a, is a sad occasion. But we have to be also celebrating the, the glorious life of Phyllis Schlafly and that it helps commemorate it here to know that uh, one of the people that was closest to Phyllis has made the trip here to be on the floor as we discuss her life and celebrate her life. Real to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber. Well, thank you. I thank my colleague, Mr. King, and I too want to echo that for Congresswoman Michelle Bachman being here. What a treat. What an absolute treat. We miss her, by the way. We, we, uh, we do miss you, so thank you for being here, Michelle, and all that you've done. You know, Mr. Speaker, 
We did not recently lose a true conservative. We didn't recently lose the first lady of the conservative movement. We didn't just lose someone who was a threat to the liberal agenda and a threat to communists. No, no, no. Phyllis Schlafly was much more than that. You know, eagles are known, Mr. Speaker, for their strength and their ability to soar high above the clouds. Eagles are known to be above the fray. Phyllis was our eagle. However, she was that eagle who, while in the fray, maintained that 30,000-foot view. And she was much more than that. She was a warrior. She was a leader. She embodied American patriotism and liberty. In 1975, Ms. Schlafly founded the Eagle Forum, which has been the pillar in the pro-family conservative movement for four decades and counting. There is no doubt, Mr. Speaker, that the Eagle Forum will live on, and we will see her eagle soar higher and higher with time. Mrs. Schlafly was the heart and soul of the conservative movement in the early days. You know, many people thought she wouldn't make a difference. But as we look back, Mr. Speaker, history is telling us otherwise. You know, you hear it over and over again that one person cannot make a difference. Well, I will tell you that Phyllis Schlafly was living proof that one person can make a difference. Phyllis soared the highest, cared the most, and fought the hardest more than anyone else for our conservative values. Mr. Speaker, since the day I was sworn in, not quite four years ago, I've been saying it's time to put America first. Through all of Mrs. Schlafly's work at the very core of her efforts, she wanted to ensure that our country was first and that Americans were our top priority and that the federal government and even state governments knew their place. You know, I find great comfort, Mr. Speaker, in knowing that in some small way, Lord willing, I might be allowed to take part in ensuring that the work of Phyllis Schlafly continues. She was a passionate woman who loved this country, loved her family, and was fiercely, fiercely driven to ensure that our liberties were protected and that the unborn, the unborn would have a fighting chance to the guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mr. Speaker, those who know Phyllis know she always put family first. Politics second. I can't help but believe that she knew that at the core of politics, it really was, really is, God first, family and country second, and political activism stemmed from that. Phyllis knew that. And by the way, she cared so much for this country, she came out early on in support of Donald Trump knowing it would raise eyebrows. But that was Phyllis. You never doubted where she stood. You never doubted her convictions. Mr. Speaker, she did all that for her family because she cared about future generations of Americans. Above all, I appreciate her commitment to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can take great heart in knowing that Phyllis joins her husband of uh, 44 years, Fred, in the kingdom of heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Our hearts and prayers go out to her family. Mr. King, you said six kids, 16 grandchildren, 16 grandchildren. Phyllis was an amazing person who lived an amazing life and did so much good. For that, I will be forever grateful to her and the work she did for the conservative movement. I want to thank you, my, my colleague, Mr. King, for allowing me this opportunity to memorialize one of the greatest Americans. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. You know I'm right. 
Reclaim my time and thanking the gentleman from Texas for coming down to help memorialize the life of Phyllis Schlafly. And uh, Madam Speaker, might I inquire how much time I have remaining? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And the uh, the things that come to mind as I listen to Mr. Weber uh, talk about Phyllis Schlafly, and um, I look across at Michelle Bachman, and I think of a, a time that Phyllis took us back into a uh, into a room in St. Louis to sit and talk to both of us about the future and the destiny of the country. Uh, it was a three of us sitting there having a little snack and chatting away on the Constitution and the value of life and marriage and the and the and the current and the destiny of America. Phyllis always saw it, as I think someone may mention, from 10,000 feet. And the time I spend here in this Congress, and I, this time I have the privilege of dealing with people at some of the highest levels in the country, the longer I'm at this, the fewer people I'm able to identify that can see with clarity the big picture and understand the currents of the course of history and the cultural movements that operate within this course of history that are actually driving it. Phyllis always saw it. She always saw it with a clarity. And that's what drove her to put 27 books out. And, and one of them was uh, in support of Donald Trump. Uh, she had time in the last years of her life, uh, the conservative case for Trump that's published. And I think of the work that she got done. If somebody said to me, uh, well, Donald Trump is going to be the nominee, and we maybe know this about the time of the Indiana primary, um, and why don't you just go out and write a book and publish that? To pull that off and get that done, to do that when you're 92? I recall the time when Phyllis broke her hip, and uh, she was in a hospital in St. Louis. And so I thought, I need to talk to Phyllis, and I just want to wish her well. And I, and I call her up. Well, yes, yeah, she's in the hospital bed, all right. But they'd already, the first thing, when she comes out from under the anesthetic, she asks for her laptop. And she's at, the, she's at the hospital bed with a laptop, no doubt, writing, <laughs> producing documents, uh, printing things, moving public policy in America from the hospital bed. Another occasion, uh, I, was, um, I had, had the privilege to be named to present an award to Phyllis here in Washington, D.C. And uh, it, was at a, it was at an event in a hotel here in town. And so I'm, I'm thinking, how do I make this work? Because actually my schedule wouldn't work for that. And I, I can't let Phyllis down. But then I learned that Phyllis had hurt her back and she'd gone in for back surgery. And so I think I know how to do this. I will tape a video for the people that are there to commemorate Phyllis, and then I'll go visit her in St. Louis on my way back to Iowa. So I flew to St. Louis and went to the, it was actually at the nursing home where she was recovering from this back surgery, and she sat there and told me, well, her lap is covered with books and works and things like we know, and she sat there and told me how, well, yes, they had to put some cement in her back. And she says, yeah, is it just like it comes out of the truck? Well, pretty much, she said. They just go in there and fill in the gaps that I have, and now I have to take a little therapy, and I'll be fine. Well, she was fine mentally. This woman had an aura about her. There was a radiance about her. I can only name three people that I have laid eyes on in my lifetime that when they were in the room, you knew it, and you knew there was something emanating from the character, the spirit, the soul, and the intellect of Phyllis Schlafly. And it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary life. And I know that her close friends was Louis Gohmert, who was here tonight on the floor. And I'd appreciate it if, if Congressman Gohmert, our friend from Texas, would uh, say a few words about Phyllis. Thank you so much. What a woman. What a person. Phyllis Schlafly led efforts to return America to being a shining light on a hill that it had been, but the light was dimming. She could see that. She could see the harm that was happening to our most vulnerable. And she led an effort more years than anybody that I've ever known personally to return America to being a citadel for freedom and for morality from which freedom can only grow. She saw us losing our way, yet she remained relentless. 
Those who despised her know better than most anyone else. This is someone who would never, ever give up. She was a leader, a warrior, a mentor, a friend. And like very dear friends, like family, you have disagreements sometimes, but you knew her heart. You knew she wanted what was best for you, for this country, for the world. Phyllis if the will gentleman would to, yield, I'd just like yeah. to interject here that when I disagreed with Phyllis, I started with the assumption I was probably wrong, <laughs> and I yield back. That's a great assumption when it comes to Phyllis. Well, he has fought the good fight. She's finished her course. She's kept the faith. I'll be there Saturday morning with her family. But the best memorial we can give to Phyllis Lafley is to make sure the light of freedom and morality does not die in America. Thank you. Are you back? We clear my time in thanking the gentleman from Texas for a very moving presentation here. And I know that it, it means something very deeply in his heart as it does in ours is here on the floor and across this country by the thousands. And uh, a couple of things that I would uh, want to just quickly inject into the discussion. She would want me to say Article 3, Section 2, court stripping. We don't need to genuflect to the supremacists. The court has gotten out of control. The Constitution is set up to where they're to be the weakest of the three branches of government, not a superior supremacist branch of government. Phyllis handed me the manuscript to this book, as I had a lot of long plane flights to do, and the manuscript was just printed off a copy machine and kind of clipped together. I worked through all of that. I wrote my edits on it, my notes in the margins, red ink. I worked through it for hours. In fact, it was days. And I got lost on the plane on the way back from actually Africa. I went to Phyllis and said, Phyllis, I need a little more time to work on the edits of your book. And because the manuscript has been lost in the, in the, in the freight, in the luggage. And she looked at me and she said, well, Congressman, I didn't intend for you to edit my book. I just intended for you to have an early copy. I knew exactly what I wanted to say. And um, this, uh, the book stands up uh, as she knew exactly what she wanted to say. That's a lot about her intellect and her personality. With utter clarity, the clearest political thinker of our time, based in, in biblical values, values of Christianity, constitutional values, a clear understanding of people and humanity and faith and family. She wrote on so many topics, and she had was utter clarity on topic after topic after topic. Um, she lived a life of 92 years, and she was a player on the public arena uh, since immediately at post-World War II, and she was a, she's a player in our lives to this day. And she's in our hearts, she's in our souls, she's in our conscience, and she affects our thinking and our actions, and she will for a long, long time to come. This is a woman who has redirected the destiny of America, and I can't think of anyone who has had, uh, any, any, any woman who's had more impact on the course of history in the United States of America, nor weighs more heavily on our sense of duty on what we need to do going forward to continue to honor the glorious life of Phyllis Schlafly. Rest in peace, Phyllis.